Hi, I'm Tom Burgess and welcome to The Real Agenda, the podcast for political change. Now there seems to be no question that our democracy has been damaged. The UK has become even more polarised, but not just on party lines. Key decisions are not getting resolved and the issues that rarely matter, like extreme inequality and increasing poverty, are not getting fixed. People want to see a more compassionate and just society where everyone can enjoy a good standard of living and a purposeful life. Now, we expect our government to play a key role in this, but it's just not happening. What has happened to our democracy? I wanted to find out how we could improve our democracy and for it to help resolve inequalities. So I turned to Simon Reed Henry, who has been looking at this subject. He's just published a book called Empire of Democracy, The Remaking of the West. Simon is an associate professor at Queen Mary University of London, and he holds a joint position as senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute Oslo, where he lives. So I started by asking Simon, what is wrong with our democracy? Hi Tom, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I mean, I think, you know, most basically our political vocabulary has gotten out of sync with the problems we're confronting and with the institutions that we've inherited from the, from the past. So, I mean, I talk about this a bit in the, in the book. I mean, I think a lot of what's gone wrong with liberal democracy today was actually set in train, not recently, not with Brexit, not with Trump, but a long time before that in the 1970s, and not just in one country, actually, but across the Western world. You know, I think the first thing is that when we talk about things being a bit pear-shaped today, we, we do well to remember this history. For example, exactly 44 years ago in 1975, a famous and influential commission called the Trilateral Commission, which reported on what it called then the crisis of democracy afflicting the Western society. So what was that commission? It was called the Trilateral Commission. Commissioned by who? A commission by the the Crisis of Governability Report, which is itself a revealing phrase, produced in 1975 by the Trilateral Commission, um, authored by a series of senior academics at the time. It was very influential. And essentially what it says was that there was an excess, in their words, of democracy. There was too much democracy. The the general sort of fallout from that was that we needed to respond by by making parliaments more effective, by making executives more powerful, by cutting back on the power of of civil society, on the vehicles by which popular mobilisation takes place, on the unions. And that really was was what happened coming out of the 70s and not just in one country. So we call it Thatcherism in this country, but it was always more than that. It was always more than a British phenomenon. And it's a reminder, I think, as our starting point, that not all democratic reform is, is progressive. So these were, in fact, suggesting that we should cut back on the democracy. Yeah. So, you know, what came out of the 1970s as a sort of, you know, the general kind of political package in which we, which we did liberal democracy at the time, well, it was a rejection of Keynesianism and a commitment to kind of anti-inflationary targeting or tight money, uh, which, you know, has the effect of making fiscal policy less uh, redistributive, less progressive. It was a turn, secondly, to, to private rights and the private sphere in place of public commitments. It was a, deter- it was a, a decline of, um, of mass political movements, a rise of professionalism in politics. So you have someone like Pierre Trudeau who comes in uh, at the start of the 19th or the end of the 1960s, start of the 1970s in Canada, and he's the classic, you know, he's Blair before, before Blair. You know, he's the, he's the image-based politician who has answers to everything but not necessary solutions to very much. And you have, the topic close to our hearts, you have, statistically speaking, a return of inequality from 1971. You know, that long arc of the decline of inequality in, Western, uh, in the Western economies starts to turn back up again from, 19, from 1971. And in fact, linking this back to, to the problem of, of democracy, if you divide a graph into income quintiles and set that against people's reported interest in politics, what you get in effect is a sort of Nike swoosh get moving towards the topper in the topper income quintiles and much greater interest in politics relative to those at the bottom with actually not the poorest of all but the lower middle classes being the ones who become most dissatisfied most uh, disaffected with democracy and of course if you track that through to the present that is your lower middle class group the ones who've lost out most from globalization the ones who are fueling the current crisis in the states and across europe in terms of you know, voting for populist parties or for platforms which are xenophobic, anti-immigrant and so forth. I think the sort of package so of reforms that was put together bottom. in the 70s really has, really has transformed democracy. So there's an interest at the bottom income stack, then 
and but then a lot more interest at the top income scale, yeah, and, yeah. and then a, this lower bit in between. Because it because it is rational to think that, right? If you are at the top of income, there are ways in which you can influence the current political system in ways that work. If you look at lobbying, for example, in the US, the top 10% of, of income earners in the US are the ones who contribute to, to political lobbies, you know, not the rest. So it really is a question of what you know, political scientists call power proportionate to states. You know, that's what you want. You want people who have vulnerabilities and exposure to policies to be the same ones who have a chance to shape those policies. But with lobbies and the lobby system and so forth, that's, that's what you lose. So is the answer to get those in the middle more interested or more engaged in politics? I think the answer is actually to think across the spectrum and to find the ways of engaging all groups in the right way, okay, which means both being responsible in the way we vote and also effective. So a lot of what we'll get on to talk about later is about forms of democratic um, procedures, for example, that we might be able to change that will allow us to make voting more effective. But there's a second element that often gets missed out there, and that is also making it more meaningful. It's not just about having a right to vote, you might say. It's also about having a, a duty to vote, a duty to vote responsibly. That means being informed. That means being educated about certain issues. And that, of course, is a, is a societal responsibility, not just an individual one. But of course, much of what we've, much of the way political discourse has, has run over the last few decades has been about this focus on individual rights and what we as individuals deserve from society, what, we, what it is our due to receive. And that, in many ways, precludes these wider discussions about the things that we might put back, about the things that we might be able to collectively come to some sort of agreement about. And that, I think, is one of the, the sort of the underlying problems, if you like, in this whole question around how democracy and its relationship to inequality play out in, in modern society. So we're saying, then, that the rise in inequality is directly linked or is linked to the demise of democracy. Yes, I think on a fundamental level, political equality and economic equality are linked. Any democratic society worth its salt needs to reckon with that fact. But at the same time, and this goes back to my point about the 1970s and the fact that we've been here before, we also need not to exaggerate about the current moment. And it's very easy to talk about it as a crisis of democracy, but we need to remember we have been here before. So, you know, God forbid none of us should forget the murder of Joe Cox, for example. But in the 1970s, again, there were lots of killings just like that, including of, of mainstream politicians. Aldo Moro, the former Prime Minister of, of Italy and the head of the Christian Democrats, was kidnapped in 1978 and later turned up in a boot of a Renault 4. In October 1970, in Canada, again, the sitting gov government minister, Pierre Laporte, was held to ransom and, and, and later murdered. You know, of course, is cause for relief, but it means we we might not want to single out the current moment as somehow unique. And I think also there's a positive reason to not exaggerate the current moment. And that is the fact that democratic reform is happening all the time, already. This has been the case historically, so in this country let's look back to, you know, to Chartism in the 1830s and 1840s, the effort to move the vote from the owners of property to a wider mass at that time, just male suffrage. As a political movement, that was based on the economic injustices of the time, in particular the injustice of the new poor law reforms of 1834, which meant that people weren't able to receive welfare outside, they had to go to the workhouse. So that sort of level of economic equality directly drove the political counter-movement, if you like, that was, that was Chartism. And of course Chartism didn't succeed at the time in gaining universal male suffrage, that had to wait until what was it, 1918, I think, uh, at the end of the First World War. But it did set in motion the the language of change and the, and the mobilisation at the, at the level of society in order to bring that about. So is it history repeating itself? It is partly, and yet also of course history doesn't repeat itself for the simple reason that democracy doesn't remain the same. You know, so British democracy in the 19th century is not the same as British democracy post-1945, is not, as I've, you know, I think for the first time tried to really set out in this book, the same as British democracy post-1970s track forward again to the 1990s and if you read a book by someone like Camille Bedok, uh, her book Reforming Democracy, I mean, she's actually done a study of this, between 1990 and 2010 there were 161 uh, specific democratic reforms undertaken so this, so this stuff is happening, people are engaging in it, it's just a case of how do you, how do you get that over the, um, you know, over the initial barrier as it were, over the tipping point of making that a wider public debate that people can get, that people can get behind. So and how do you do that? 
Okay, well, I mean, the lesson of her book is that we should be encouraged by electoral uncertainty. That provides the moment, if you like, or the opening for that to happen. So we could say... To well, like now. To like now, yeah, exactly. The more political upheaval there is, in that sense, you know, the more, the more likely democratic reforms are. As we said, not all democratic reforms being good, there, there needs to be more to that story, I think. So one of the things that I try to say is that we need to be aware of what our democracy is, representative democracy. Certainly in the aftermath of Brexit, there's been so much talk about the fact that we need to give the people a voice, or you know, Theresa May has used this, the, you know, the, 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 the British people have spoken and so forth. But representative democracy isn't actually that. It's a stop, it's a stop go power over the election of national representatives who will go and make the decisions. Reform is therefore always going to be tied to particular constituencies, or if you want to use a more loaded term, classes. Democratic reform has to happen if you follow that line of reasoning, first of all, intellectually, it's people like you and me sitting and discussing it. Secondly, socially, before it happens institutionally, and that is the sort of the third and the final thing, and, and in the case of Chartism, right, that took, that took over, over half a century. But secondly, there's a catch here, because the material world we inhabit, I think, has become divorced from the political vocabulary that we've, that we've inherited. So we've got to find a new way of talking about these things in the first place before we can begin to make those, those changes from the ground up. So what could that be? Well, people often say it's a problem of political will. You know, there's no, there's no political will for doing these things, and, and, and they're very right. Politicians aren't listening. But we then, I think, have to ask ourselves, are we speaking to them in the, in, the, in the right way? And to answer that question, we need not just an observation of what's wrong, we need a diagnosis of why it's wrong, right? And so that, I think, brings us on to this whole question of what actually is wrong, what does need fixing with, with democracy today, if we want to make you know, societies fairer, more equal, okay. more just. So what do you think? I think, first of all, it varies between countries, but there are certain similarities. And looking across a whole swathe of you know, Western democracies in the US and Canada and in Europe and so forth, I fall back on the idea that there are sort of three fundamental types of problem. First of all, there's a crisis of political identity. So what does that mean? Uh, it means what we're seeing all around us, populism and insurgent parties, people reaching out for, for you know, a, a much more authoritative affirmative political voice and of course one man's populist is another man's authoritarian right but that that the center point of that debate is really about the clarity of political voice and Trump for all that you might dislike the content of what he says does speak candidly and that is part of his appeal and anyone who wishes to do away with Trump has to recognize that so there's a crisis of political identity in that sense there's also a crisis of political leadership you know this move to the professional style that we were that we were talking about earlier on of surface over over substance and i think more subtly under that heading i'd also say that there's a crisis of political ethos or, or character what i mean by this is really at the level of strategy that political parties have adopted so in the us so i know you, you lived there for a while and, and, I, and you know, i've been there many times a lot of what happened from the 80s and 90s onwards on the left of the political spectrum was about trying to triage policy programs with a very rich donor constituency and a wider mass base that would elect you and get you into power. So this is what Clinton and the New Democrats really kind of epitomised. Well, as it was said to me, you know, that your constituents are the donors. Your constituents are the donors, yeah, and, and as in, they in also the US, said, yeah, the, not, not here, but uh, as it should be, right? And so there, are, and there are ways that we can make that more well, as it should be here, i.e., not as it should be here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they also said in the US, you know, we, we're the party of the, you know, we, the, we go for the million, the million voters. You know, we shoot where the ducks were. Is another phrase they used to they used to use. But what that meant in, 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 in real terms was that they pumped for identity politics or sort of trying to play off one marginal constituency against another, which is, which is great. You have to recognize marginal voices and constituencies, support the minorities. But that was at the expense of what you might call a more civic universal set of policies that would say we're all in this together on some levels. And things like tax reform or progressive taxes, things like uh, universal health care, things like welfare, all those require actually civic collective universal buy-in if they're going to be successful. And this has been the great problem, the great tension in trying to resolve a world that's becoming steadily more unequal with a political system that is in a sense chasing the tail of that problem rather than reaching around it and trying to establish you know, a, a firmer base from which, to, from which to speak. Well, one of the things is, isn't it, and this is the US and the UK, it's, uh, and probably more so in the US, is the lack of a positive agenda by so many politicians. It's about how bad you are, and in that case, you know, how bad the current president in the US is, rather than this is my positive agenda, apart from certain candidates like Bernie Sanders, who does actually be quite specific yeah. about things in his agenda. 
actually it just seems to be the same here to a much lesser extent that and particularly there's a leadership election going on for one of the parties here I understand um, but there seems to be no substance uh, very little substance about what are you going to do to fix these things you know we had Theresa May talking about the burning injustice she came in the Prime Minister did nothing so how are we going to fix this how are we going to fix this democracy so people actually do or we get stuff done that actually makes life better absolutely for yeah no right well that's that, you know my answer to that is always we have to un we have to understand it first so why are politicians not saying much it's because they don't they don't dare and why they don't dare well that brings us on to the second set of reasons which is the problem in political institutions you know the, the traditional parties are in decline. They don't have the voter base they once did. So, so politicians are running scared, rightly so, as we would be if we were in their positions. Uh, we don't have the same levels of unionisation that we used to have, which, you know, whether you want to be a member of a union or not, you have to recognise it was a base from which people could formulate collective ideas and debate those at the, at the public scale. So, you know, there are all these sorts of problems in the institutions that we inherited from initially the post-war era, like the welfare state and so forth, which were tweaked, if not fundamentally reconfigured coming out of the 1970s and which has sort of held on for the last few decades but which now really finally are reaching the point where we have to decide they need we need some some more concrete structural reforms to to address them so that's why I say the second set of problems are around this sort of crisis in in political institutions and then the third set of uh, problems actually comes back more Tom to what you were saying and that's a sort of crisis of political vision okay so truth for example the role of truth in public debate we hear about this in terms of post-truth. Okay, but what does that mean? Bernard Williams had a lovely way of thinking about truth. He divided it into two things. One was factual truth. You know, objectively, did something happen or did it not? But the second is sincerity and talking about things in a way that is sincere. And if you go back to that sort of new democratic triage era of politics, you can see how somebody like Hillary Clinton, for example, could be so different to Trump in terms of her commitment to factual truth, but in terms of the sincerity side of things, actually almost become more vulnerable to critique from what she called the, you know, the basket of, of deplorables and that sort of terribly uh, unhelpful phrase. And actually then politically come a cropper for, for thinking exactly that. So, so recentering truth in a, in, a sort of, in a much more meaningful way in politics is one thing that we have to do. Do we, for example, talk about the fact that there are 300,000 homeless people on the streets, you know, I have to step over 10 of them just to get here today, it's, it's a crisis. Or do we talk about that as being, there are one in 200 of us in this country on the streets? I mean, that's a slight different way of saying the same thing, but the, but the message is really different. It shows you that they really are a part of us. And we need to find ways, our politicians need to find ways to sort of incorporate that in, well, their, it's not in their discourse. Touching on that, it's sort of not othering people, it's others. Precisely. It's, in fact, it's us. It's recognising that, that, that we all do have a responsibility for this and actually we do often have more say in some of these things than we, than we say. So is one of the answers that there should be more compassion in, in, in politics? I think there certainly needs to be compassion in politics. This is, and that's nothing new, that people have been, been, been calling for that for a long time. And of course, compassion, yes, but also aspiration, raising the level of what things we think we can actually address in this country in particular. Are you an optimist? Is a good time for change to happen? Are we creating the environment for radical change? I think it is actually. Do you know? And I, I know that sounds slightly perverse in light of all that we've been all that we've been saying. But you know, go back to what I was mentioning about the Trilateral Commission in 1975. That was negativity. You know, that was look at the problems of democracy. Look how much there is to fear. It's helped to create a climate of fear, and that's the opposite of what we need. We need actually, I think, to force ourselves to be optimistic. And that means thinking very long and hard about the sorts of things that we can actually that we can actually change. And there are things that we can change if we set our minds to them. And if you then start to look around, you see that actually there are places where this is beginning to happen that we can that we can draw inspiration from. I was thinking about this beforehand, and I can think of at least sort of five types of democratic reform that are that are real, that have been tried in different places, and that are worth discussing in the context of this of this country. Some of which may be more necessary than others. Like what? Well, to start in the UK. The obvious one has to be electoral form, and actually, I did a I did a little Twitter poll this morning to see whether it was just me thinking this or whether or whether other people were doing it. So it's only it's not been out for uh, for very long, but looking at the result right now of a series of of, of possible electoral reforms, I suggested 94% at present plump for for electoral reform in this country. So what does that mean? That means you know most simply moving away from first past first past the post, 
to, to proportional representation. So the problem with first past the post is that it allows a minority to form a, to form a majority. The problem is that it, your vote doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily count. You know? So if, if somebody already has a majority in a particular area, then every vote but beyond that is, 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 is a waste of votes. Well, and what about the other things that, that you... About the other types of possible reform. reforms? Yes. Well, we could look to more, if we move this as well on a scale of sort of gradually more participatory, okay, so we, we start with electoral reform as keeping representative democracy but improving it through to what we'll ultimately get to, which will be a much more direct form of democracy. The second one on that sort of spectrum will be citizens' assemblies. So there have been efforts to do this in this country, in Sheffield, in Southampton. And what do citizens' assemblies do? Well, they include people, first of all. They select people to come and talk and discuss and reflect. And let's just put Brexit into the mix here. Reflection, I think we could both agree, was something that didn't. That there wasn't much of then. It's been tried, as I said before, it's been tried in Canada, not just in this country, it's been tried in Ireland. I think yeah. actually there hasn't been a, a repeat about it on the of, show, actually, of yeah, Brexit. Yes, before, exactly. Yeah. You know, earlier episodes, particularly with Compass, they were very much in favour of pushing that. And they've been one of the ones pushing for this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, so what, what, what else could we do? The, then so we could look two. to... That's two. <laughs> what else could we do? I want the answers. We, okay. could look to, we could look to how you bring about democratic control over public finance. Okay, so participatory budgeting would be a third one here. And that links very directly to, to how you address inequalities, for example, especially economic inequalities. This is where citizens will decide how a certain amount of public money, money is spent, and it usually is a, a sort of predetermined pot. It began in uh, Porto Alegre in Brazil in 1989, very famously. And interesting, because that's been such a long-running experiment, what you do see over time is that it does have effects, so and more money in Porto Alegre has gone to poor areas as a, as a direct result of, of participatory budgeting uh, agendas. And it's done something else as well, which is interesting politically. It's he it helped ge generate in Brazil a political constituency for the Workers' Party, which is what then brought Lula into power. And, uh, it's been done in Tower Hamlets. I think about £5 million pounds was put aside for, for citizens in Tower Hamlets to come together and decide how that money would be, would be spent locally. So that's the third one. Fourth one, well, what about compulsory voting? We don't do it here, but they do do it in some countries. They do it in Australia. There are, again, pros and cons of this, and, and some of these things aren't always relevant in every country, but what does it do? Well, it forces everyone to get involved. Potentially, it therefore makes people you know, read those articles about the parties that are coming up before an election. It makes them feel that it is perhaps a civic duty rather than simply a, a right to vote, and that it's a, it's a thing to be done very carefully. You know, you won't get that scenario post-Brexit, everyone Googling, you know, what is the EU? <laughs> so I think you know, that, that offers some, some, some interesting ways forward and, and, and we know that it, that it can work, it's been tried. And so the fifth one I'd suggest then would be, would be direct democracy, or what people sometimes call co-participation. Co this, is, this, I mean, this is good for you if you did like Brexit. You know? So this is, this is what you have in Switzerland most famously. I mean, that's the country that's really gone, gone longest on, on and furthest what on do you mean participatory by voting. Um, so this Great means, democracy. well, in the classic sense, it, it meant everyone gathering around in a square and raising their hands. And sometimes in certain sort of local cantons in Switzerland, that is how they, they decide things. People literally put their, put their hands up. But of course, we live in a modern world. You can do this technologically. You can do the same yeah. things by, by vote. What it essentially means is that in between elections, there are things that people themselves may want to decide on, and those people should be able to decide on that directly. Put, put it to a vote. It can also include the sort of things that happen in California, which you know, you're probably more familiar with, which is sort of initiative processes. So citizens, if they can get enough signatures. Oh, the propositions that they Propositions they call it, yeah. yeah. So, and, and again, propositions can work both ways, right? You can, you can and, but maybe that's their strength, that they give different people a voice in the context of a prevailing climate that may not be of the politics of their choosing. So they have to get enough signatures, they put it together, and then that can, if it's done within a certain period of time, can be put to, put to a vote as well. So there is a cause for optimism and we, you, there's some definite ideas about things that could in, radically improve our I democracy. think the scope of things we can do is so much broader than the discussion, especially in this country actually, so much focuses around you know, the problems of the current two political parties and it's partly the problem of our adversarial political culture, which is partly the inheritance going back to it's our great luck to have this rich parliamentary tradition in this country. In some ways, in the 21st century, it can also be a hindrance and I think we need to dare more democracy, you know, as Willie Brandt said, in a very different context in the 1970s or 1969. I think we need to do that here in this country today. We need to find ways of opening up the discussion. OK, Simon, thank you very much indeed. That's oh, it's great. Been such a pleasure talking. Thanks so much for that, Simon. Now, Simon's book, Empire of Democracy, is available at all good bookstores. Now, what do you think? Contact us at info at realagenda.org or via our website, realagenda.org. We'd love to hear from you. We hope that we've helped to inform, involve and inspire you into action. 
So coming soon on The Real Agenda, we're looking at our outdated voting system and talking to the team at Make Votes Matter. And we're looking at the really fundamental issue of human rights and why we don't respect them. Plus, of course, our weekly studio show, The Weekly Wake Up, which sets the alarm on what is really happening in our country and what we can do about it. A special thanks to our sponsors, the Reverse Media Group, one of the fastest growing search and media companies. Find out why at reversemediagroup.com. One thing is certain, people want to see change to a more compassionate and just society, as well as more courageous politicians prepared to do the right thing for people over party. It's urgent and it's up to us to make it happen. That's The Real Agenda. I'm Tom Burgess. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.